Tonight, another U.S. mass killing, this time near L.A., a celebration of the Lunar New Year torn apart. We want to know. We want to know how something like this, something this awful can happen. At least 10 are dead, and so is the suspect. Anti-government demonstrators take to the streets in Israel. I'm protesting because the democracy in Israel is at stake. The Canadian poet with huge sales and sold-out shows. It felt like I was heard for the first time, and I was like, I love this feeling. It changed everything. My conversation with Rupi Kaur. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. There can be some relief in California tonight after police confirmed the suspect in the latest mass killing there is no longer a threat. They've identified him as a 72-year-old man announcing he's been found dead after a tense, hours-long manhunt. But for the community of Monterey Park, the grieving has just begun. That's where at least 10 people were shot and killed and another 10 wounded on the Saturday night of what was supposed to be a weekend of celebration. This is Lunar New Year, and the festival in Monterey Park was expected to draw thousands. Instead, as Cameron McIntosh explains, it's where a gunman hit first before setting out, police say, for yet another target. The suspect surrounded in this van. Police waited, watched, and planned. Our sheriff's uh, SWAT team approached and cleared the van and determined the suspect sustained a self-inflicted gunshot wound and was pronounced dead at the scene. Police say this man, 72-year-old Hu Can Tran, opened fire with an assault pistol in this dance studio, leaving five men and five women dead at the scene and more wounded. Less than 30 minutes later, police say he went to another dance hall where he was disarmed and fled in a white van. Hours later, police pulled him over south of Los Angeles. During the search, several pieces of evidence were found inside the van, linking the suspect to both locations in, Al in uh, Monterey Park and Alhambra. What was the motive for this shooter? Did he have a mental illness? Was he a domestic violence abuser? How did he get these guns? And was it through legal means or not? Monterey Park is more than 65% Asian. This weekend, thousands were out celebrating the Lunar New Year. I have confidence that we will, we will get over this crisis because we must. And we, can, we will only do so if we do it together as a community. This is the deadliest shooting in the U.S. since the Uvalde school massacre in Texas last May. Yet another community has been torn apart by senseless gun violence. All of us in this room and in our country understand this violence must stop. One familiar refrain after another. Thoughts and prayers to all the families involved in this. It's, it's, it's a horrible incident for our county. Beyond the immediate tragedy of so many lives lost, this is the 33rd mass shooting involving four or more people and the fifth mass killing in this country so far this year. It's only three weeks in. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Washington. And journalist Steve Futterman is in Monterey Park tonight. Steve, there's still a question of motive in this case, as we heard yes. in Cam's story. What are police saying about that? Police are saying nothing officially right now. They are certainly, though, looking at the possibility that this 72-year-old man, he was, a, he was an elderly man, the, the man who fired the gun, who killed 10 people, that he may have known someone in the dance hall that he targeted. And there was a second dance hall he went to that has a connection between, uh, the, there's a connection between the two dance halls. So there may have been someone that he was aware of. There may have been a domestic dispute. That's something that officials are focusing in right now, but certainly nothing's been closed. They're looking at every possibility, but certainly a domestic connection is something they're really focusing on, at least tonight, right now. And this was, as we pointed out, supposed to be a huge uh, celebration weekend. Yeah. Instead, it's tragedy that is drawing people together. And, and how are they reacting, Steve? Well, you know, people woke up this morning at sh in shock. Uh, the, uh, this occurred at around 10.30 last night. Most people went to sleep last night not knowing what had happened. They were getting up today expe expecting this to be the second day of the Lunar New Year's Festival here in Monterey Park. As you heard before, a very popular festival. Thousands come here every year to take part in the Lunar New Year's Festival. So I think the fact that you have a mass murder obviously shocks the community. 
they have that old reaction. I didn't think it could happen here. But when you add the fact that they were expecting it to be a very festive, wonderful day, and it turns out to be one of the worst days that they can have, I think that just makes this even worse than a, what you would say, a normal mass killing. They are just shocked here. They will get over it. They will recover. But this was not the day they expected this to be. This was supposed to be a day that they would spend with their families and friends and celebrate. It was nothing like that today. All right, Steve Futterman, thank you. Thank you. And the Prime Minister is offering his condolences to all of those affected by the shooting, saying his heart breaks for them. We'll be there for whatever kind of support Canada can offer, but uh, our hearts uh, go out to all the communities and the families of the loved ones uh, who were affected by this terrible, uh, terrible incident around uh, New Year's uh, celebrations. He was speaking as he arrived in Vancouver to celebrate the Lunar New Year. Large crowds took to the streets of the city's historic Chinatown to mark the day. It's a Vancouver tradition that was missed earlier in the pandemic and that people were pleased to get back even as they absorb news of the tragedy in California. Susanna De Silva tells us about the celebration and concern. The Lions had a little extra energy this year, pent up after the pandemic put a pause on the party. It's been a good few years since we've had this, so it's good to be back. Seeing everybody out here, it's just a great feeling. And even in the shadow of the California shooting, the thousands who came to see them were ready too. So happy. Wow, you see? <laughs> many, many people here. It's really nice to see uh, everybody so cheerful and happy. Go hit for Troy, and this is and a happy new year. Linda So and her two young boys were able to get a prime seat. She says community today is even more important because of the rise of crimes BC saw during the pandemic targeting people of Asian descent. It's not just Asians here, it's everybody coming together. So it's really great to have everybody just enjoy the event together. I mean, it does weigh on me because growing up, I, never, I was fortunate, I never had to go through that. So nowadays, I think about them when they grow up a lot. It's been enough to make some think twice about their plans. We have to be fearful to be dressing our kids up to celebrate. Um, so definitely, it's definitely something that weighs on your mind. Extra security and police were added to this year's event. Police presence bumped up even further after the first details of the California shootings emerged. You'll see police everywhere uh, and, and they're there simply to reassure the community. Organizers hoping this year's Zodiac animal, the rabbit, will help change the conversation. We want the uh, rabbit can bring all the kindness and all the harmony to the community. Yeah, and also more people come back to the Chinatown. And some already saw the spirit of the rabbit in the crowd. It kind of looks like everybody likes every kind of one. The spirit of kindness those here hope will last all year. Happy New Year! Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. The Canadian Coast Guard says it's working to contain an oil spill in Vancouver's English Bay. Officials were tipped off about an oil slick coming from a container ship just before noon on Saturday. A containment boom has been deployed to keep the oil from spreading. About 100 litres are believed to have leaked out. More health care funding may soon be coming to Canada's provinces and territories, despite what seems like a time of increased conflict with the federal government. Marina von Stackelberg now with one of the reasons behind a possible breakthrough. Healthcare horror stories, from ER closures to ballooning wait lists for procedures, and recently two Nova Scotia patients who died waiting for care. Then there's descriptions from doctors in emergency department rooms like this. Paramedics are waiting with their patients strapped to stretchers. They stretch the entire length of the emergency department. Um, I can hear them crying. I can hear the patients yelling. I can hear them vomiting, uh, they're suffering. For years, the provinces and territories have demanded the federal government give them more money for their health care systems. They want a significant increase from $42 billion to $70 billion a year. Now a deal may be coming. The reason? Public opinion. On CBC's Rosemary Barton Live, New Brunswick's Premier says he thinks public pressure is having a big impact. This has been a long process um, that, that has really ramped up in the last several weeks, so, so that is good news. And I am optimistic that we will strike a, a deal in, in February. Ottawa says it will only give the provinces more money if they meet specific goals, like reducing operation backlogs and improving primary and mental health care. 
Some provinces have said they want the money with no strings attached. Ottawa has signaled a deal is coming, but warns even a cash injection won't be an immediate cure-all. Even if there's an agreement and federal support for provinces financially increases, uh, to train a radiology technician, a nurse, uh, a family doctor, it's not going to happen overnight. Long-term challenges for a medical system that needs help now. It's demoralizing, it's frustrating, um, and the worst part is that uh, people are suffering. There is a time crunch to get a deal done. The federal government's spring budget is right around the corner, and it wants to make sure that budget reflects any new health care spending. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. And more evidence of the health care crisis tonight. Almost 12,000 children are on surgery wait lists across Ontario, and about half are now waiting longer than clinically recommended wait times. Pediatric hospital officials say the recent spike in flu and respiratory cases forced a tidal wave of cancelled surgeries, while the ER crunch exhausted already overworked staff. They're calling on the provincial government for more long-term support. A major step forward for some residential school survivors and their families this weekend. The federal government has agreed to pay almost $3 billion in reparations, bookending a settlement it reached with day school survivors in 2021. Deanna Sumanak Johnson has the details. For former Chief Shane Godfredson, it's a moment to reflect and celebrate. Very humbled and honored that. You know, we come to this uh, resolution. A $2.8 billion settlement between the federal government and 325 First Nations. Ten years after he first launched a class action lawsuit seeking reparations for harms done by Canada's residential school system. It just goes to show too, uh, you know, as First Nations governments, when we work together, great things can happen. The announcement is actually the second settlement in the Godfredson case. This one provides reparations for the loss of language and culture as a result of residential schools. What it can do is help address the collective harm caused by Canada's past, a deeply colonial one. A federal court still has to approve the new settlement. Once it does, an initial lump sum payment of $200,000 will be made to each of the 325 First Nations. $2.8 billion will be placed in a trust fund that will operate for 20 years. The fund will be governed by a board of nine Indigenous directors. Still, the work ahead won't be easy, says this Indigenous languages expert. At the moment, there is not one university in Canada in which a, a First Nations or an Indigenous language teacher can gain credentials and gain the knowledge they need to be able to teach. There needs to be a real organized way of supporting, of being able to support the people with the proper kind of resources that are needed to do the work. But for now, she says, this is mostly good news for Indigenous people, a view shared by Shane Godfritson. Now it's our our time to start turning you know our way of life around to to be you know learn learn our languages and our culture so exciting times definitely a chance to recover cultures once stripped away Deanna Sumanak Johnson CBC News Toronto there is growing unrest in Israel as the new government proposes legal reforms that critics call anti-democratic Sarah Levitt shows us how far a grassroots response has gone Flooding the streets of Tel Aviv, these demonstrators say they're worried about the future of their justice system and their rights. We won't let this government to take our freedom. I'm protesting because the democracy in Israel is at stake. Back in power, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is proposing sweeping judicial reform. His government wants to reduce the power of the Supreme Court and hand more over to the legislature. Israelis are very worried that the only real protections they have for human rights, for civil rights, for minority rights, for the kinds of rights that have been progressing over the years, to some extent, actually to a large extent, I would say, based on judicial review and court decisions, uh, they won't have that anymore. When Netanyahu met with his cabinet, that empty seat next to him was more evidence of a tumultuous start to his government. The Supreme Court ruled that senior cabinet member Arya Derry can't serve because he's on probation for tax offenses. 
The repercussions of Israel's political turmoil are also being felt abroad. Israel's ambassador to Canada, Ronan Hoffman, is the second top diplomat to resign. With the transition to the new government and to different policy in Israel, my personal and professional integrity has compelled me to request to shorten my post. For a diplomat to step down is particularly surprising, shocking, um, is cause for alarm. It is a striking uh, acknowledgement on the part of the Israeli Foreign Service elite that something is, is amiss. Opponents of Netanyahu's new government say they'll continue to protest on the streets in the hope his plans won't go through. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. In Turkey tonight, there's simmering anger after a second day of protests against the burning of the Quran in Sweden. Thousands filling the streets to show their disapproval of the anti-Islam activist who had burned Islam's holy book in Stockholm yesterday. That sparked protests in several cities. A sign in the window of the Swedish consulate said it doesn't share the activist's views. Sweden is trying to get Turkey to support its application for membership in NATO. <laughs> And rescue workers search for survivors in Aleppo, Syria, after the collapse of a five-story residential building. It killed at least 13 people, including one child. State media reported that leaking water had weakened the foundation. Ukraine's wait for a decision on German-made Leopard 2 battle tanks continues tonight as their soldiers along the northern frontier dig in for the next Russian incursion. Tonight, Chris Brown takes us to the trenches along that sprawling border where troops hope more Western military aid is coming. The Ukrainian soldiers dug in along the border with Belarus believe a new Russian offensive is imminent. The entire front line is a thousand kilometers long, which is a lot of territory to defend. Of course we're ready. We're ready every day, every minute. Russian troops struck south through Belarus before in the early days of the invasion, but they were driven back. Their attack was a little surprising, said Dunai, the commander. We will not let them repeat that, not only here, but in the whole country. Beyond the defenses we saw, the commander insisted there was a lot more he could not show us. And to further emphasize its readiness, Ukraine's military held very public drills near the Chernobyl nuclear plant, a message possibly to Western nations that the Russian offensive threat is immediate. Most of the contact line has been relatively stable for months, except in Bakhmut, where the battles have been constant and bloody. Over the weekend, Russian claims of successful new attacks near the southern city of Zaporizhia were countered by Ukraine, which said the invaders are being repelled. Zaporizhia has been struck repeatedly. At a humanitarian station, the sense was that something is shifting. Many here recently returned from Russian-occupied areas and have shrapnel damage on their cars to show for it. It's booming from artillery every day, every minute, said Nadia. It's become worse. Ukraine has been pleading for hundreds of German Leopard 2 heavy tanks for defense and to retake occupied territory. The answer at a key donor meeting Friday was still no decision, which has left many here exasperated. How uh, hard we should scream, uh, how persuasive we should be so we will get what we need to win this war. It's obvious for everyone that Russia is evil, right? The Russians may have up to 150,000 recently mobilized troops to throw into a new offensive. And the worry is, with so many options about where to strike, they could overwhelm the Ukrainian defenses. Chris Brown, CBC News, Zaporizhia. 256 sailors aboard HMCS Fredericton set sail on a five-month deployment to Europe. They will be a constant presence in the Mediterranean, tracking all uh, Russian activity. Each ship that goes now has to be more, uh, more ready than they were before that invasion. The ship will supplement other NATO naval forces ready to combat Russia's threat in the region. Operation Reassurance is Canada's largest current international military operation. A Canadian poet has become a global sensation, selling out concert halls across the world. The woman who comes after me will be a bootleg version of who I am. 
Rupi Kors is down with me to talk about the moments that changed everything. But in the beginning, very uncomfortable and scary and overwhelming. One year after the convoy occupation, Ottawa's famous Wellington Street remains closed. Definitely doesn't make my life any easier. Now the debate over its reopening. But first, friends and family pay tribute to Lisa Marie Presley. We're back into Can we cut this man some slack and let him lie down? Hundreds gathered today, Graceland, for a public memorial to remember Elvis Presley's only child, Lisa Marie. The singer-songwriter died 10 days ago at the age of 54. In 1968, she entered our world, born tired, fragile, yet strong. She was delicate, but was filled with life. The medical examiner says more investigation is needed in order to determine the cause of death. In the nation's capital tonight, one big question is what to do about Wellington Street? A year ago, it was taken over by protesters in open revolt against COVID restrictions. Should it be reopened to traffic, including a lot of commuters? David Thurton shows us the tangled tale of who will make that decision. It's one of the most famous streets in Canada, Wellington, right in front of Parliament Hill. Still blocked off now because this is what it looked like this time last year. The street taken hostage by the convoy, to some, is still being held hostage as most vehicles remain banned. I would lean towards reopening the street and allowing vehicles on the street while we make up our minds about the future of Wellington. Ottawa's new mayor wants a debate on this issue. He says the current arrangement isn't a good look. Reaction from locals is mixed. I just work here downtown, so it definitely doesn't make my life any easier. As a cyclist, it's really nice in the summer to be able to ride your bike uh, on that street without the danger of cars and buses. Yeah, very, well. <laughs> very well, very well. This local MP is making it known he wants the street to remain closed and to become part of Parliament Hill under federal control. This is probably the most complex bit of real estate in the country. We can make things a little bit easier when there is one body that's responsible for, uh, for making the final call on the entire jurisdiction. Behind me is the Prime Minister's office, which is protected by the RCMP. Over here, you have Parliament Hill, which has its own protective service. The rest of it, the sidewalks, the street itself, well, that's the turf of the Ottawa Police Service. The Parliamentary Protective Service wants to have authority over this whole section of Wellington. At a parliamentary committee, the head of the PPS had this to say about how they would have prepared for the arrival of a convoy. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the streets would have been blocked. There would have been no vehicles permitted to come up onto Wellington Street. The fate of this street lies with the city. It closed it so it gets to reopen it. A debate that will begin in earnest at a committee meeting this week. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. Canadian Rupi Kaur has taken the world by storm and changed the way we see poetry. Believe them when they say you are nothing. In our new series, It Changed Everything, she talks about the inspiration behind the words. The thread that stays consistent through all of my work is immigrant stories. And a young man seeks refuge in Canada after fleeing Russia and a command to fight. I don't want to kill people, uh, innocent people in Ukraine. The National takes you deeper into the stories shaping your world. Next. I've always been fascinated by those who achieve greatness. How did they get there? Who better to ask than the few who have made the journey to the very top of their field? The challenges, the turning points, the moments that changed everything. The woman who comes after me will be a bootleg version of who I am. She will try and write poems for you to erase the ones I've left memorized on your lips. Rupi Kaur might just be the most famous poet on the planet. 
Her books have sold millions of copies and have been translated into more than 40 languages. And oh yeah, in the past year alone, she's performed in more than 50 cities on a world tour that's also been turned into an Amazon Prime special. So are we ready, LA? I'm so happy that you're here. You know, I had I thought I had to become like a pop star, or yeah. like an actress to get here. No. But somehow poetry is getting me into all <laughs> Poetry is the new pop, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Cora's first self-published book, Milk and Honey, helped spark a revolution in poetry. With her trademark short poems and sketches, she caught fire on Instagram, gaining millions of followers who connected with her stories of heartbreak, trauma, and the immigrant experience. It's an inspiring story that began in India, then to Canada as a little girl, and is now taking her to stages around the world. You are a poet who tours like a rock star, who's been to Europe and South America and Australia and, and Singapore, and now back in Canada. What's it been like? It's been a dream. <laughs> like, kind of hasn't felt real. And uh, I think when it was all starting out for me and I was traveling a lot, I was sort of overwhelmed by it. But now I'm at a place where I'm feeling really present. And when I'm up there, I'm like, oh my goodness, is this real life? Like, how am I in? Paris or you know Venice and sitting with these incredible human beings and connecting on this level it's beautiful I was born in Punjab and I was three and a half when we moved to Canada I guess so I always felt split between these two lands and so even though I grew up in Canada when I got home after school you better believe I was walking right back into the motherland we had to speak, read, write, live, breathe, everything Punjabi. <laughs> I didn't learn English until like the third grade because nobody around me spoke any. And so the kids at school called me a fob, short for fresh off the boat, because I spoke English in a Indian accent. And then my cousins in Punjab made fun of me for speaking Punjabi in a Canadian accent. And that's when I realized I'm fucked. These kids don't give a shit about me. A big part of your story is the immigrant story, uh, a family that, that moved here from India and, uh, and, and tried to fit in, eventually did fit in. But you tell an interesting story about walking into kindergarten class. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I was, I'm the oldest of four kids. And so parents don't speak any English, didn't really have any cousins who spoke any English. and. Uh, so I remember going to kindergarten it's, and everyone around me is yapping away in English and I felt like I had been abducted by aliens because it was the first time I was in a setting where people were talking and I had no idea what was going on. And that's when I, I felt so voiceless because I could not communicate mm. for that early part of my life with my peers. But then even when I learned to, I'd, pro I'd been silent for so long that I just chose not to speak anyway, being extremely shy and introverted. And that's when I sort of fell in love with books. And I really just used books as not only my crutch, but they were my first friends. And so I read and I read and I read and hoping that nobody would notice that I had no other friends. So this young girl who had been abducted by aliens, who has no other friends, who, uh, for whom English is a second language, and who is shy, mm -hmm. finds her element, not just in books, but performing on stage. I mean, somebody reading that, it might kind of seem Doesn't surprising. But when you got there on stage, you loved it. I did, I did. The first time I performed, I was in high school, and, uh, and I remember going to this open mic. It was in this community center in Malton. There was maybe 25 people in the audience, but something magical happened when I was up there. It felt like I was heard for the first time. And I was like, I love this feeling. And I realized that the stage is where I started to find my voice.
You are a trailblazer in so many ways and a story that people who are fans of yours will know, but maybe not everyone does, is, is that first self-published book. And you turn that into really an extraordinary part of your career. Can, can you read us a, a poem from that book? Of course. Yeah, let me just... <laughs> so, Milk and Honey, you can surprise me. Okay, I already know which one I'm reading. This one is called The Art of Being Empty and it's on page 33. Emptying out of my mother's belly was my first act of disappearance. Learning to shrink for a family who likes their daughters invisible was the second. The art of being empty is simple. Believe them when they say you are nothing. Repeat it to yourself like a wish. I am nothing. I am nothing. I am nothing. So often, the only reason you know that you're still alive is from the heaving of your chest. Who was the young woman who wrote that? What was she thinking? Oh, um, I think that I was thinking about myself and all of the young women that I grew up with um, who were constantly told to not speak and not have opinions and to be as invisible as possible. I mean, I always was a very opinionated kid and I always made sure to share my opinions out loud. And I remember my mom would just be like, oh my goodness. And you're never going to, no one's ever going to marry you. Your mother-in-law is <laughs> going to hate you. Da, da, da. You know, it's like what she learned from, you know, her mother back in India and all of that. And she's just passing that down to me. And so I was really thinking about that and thinking about the violence also and the abuse um, that women's bodies hold, especially within the South Asian community. So you published this book at first yourself mm -hmm. and it became so popular yeah. that it eventually attracted a major publisher and you know as they say the rest is history it was mm -hmm. kind of the turnaround point like incredible success you have incredible sales um, and yet you didn't embrace all of that success like th there was a point that I've read where you felt s a certain amount of discomfort why was that? I think it just goes back to like, I'm, I've always been shy, introverted, all of those things. And so it is really, I think, definitely comfortable, more comfortable with it now, but in the beginning, very uncomfortable and scary and overwhelming to know that so many people have read this book and it's so personal. And so I think it just took a couple of years for me to really process that and accept it because it's a very weird feeling. <laughs> the other thing is you are a poet who sells millions of copies of books. Mm -hmm. I can't think of another person who's managing to do that now. When I think of poetry, I think of things that I learned decades ago in university that had been written decades before. What, what do you hope will happen to this art form? I mean, it feels like you, you've, you've made this accessible to so many people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope that 
you know, for, for me as somebody who grew up in a Punjabi household, poetry was like, is one of the main genres of literature that we consume and that we share with our families and friends. And so I hope that at least here in the West, it can become one of the, you know, main genres that we consume. And like still today, like, this book has been on the New York Times bestseller list for over a hundred weeks, but in the fiction category. So I'm hoping that over time people will realize that poetry isn't going anywhere and it does deserve a space of its own because people do want access to it. I grew up feeling so embarrassed and ashamed of my parents' accent because it was something that was so mocked here in Canada and in the West in general. And then I remember turning like 21 and something just did like a full 180 in my head and I was like, wait a minute, how can I be embarrassed of this thing when it's the only thing my parents have left of home? And that thought just, it changed everything for me and then this poem was born. I think about the way my father pulled the family out of poverty without knowing what a vowel was. And my mother raised four children without being able to construct a perfect sentence in English. So when I started to really reflect on the sacrifices that my parents had made, and so many of them, and um, so that we could have a life, so that I could have the chance to go to university. And I was moved by it to the point of tears, you know? And this is the story of so many immigrants and especially so many of the ones that I grew up around. So I really wanted to write this poem as a love letter to them. They turned a suitcase full of clothes into a life and regular paychecks to make sure that the children of immigrants wouldn't hate them for being the children of immigrants. You know, my mom still doesn't speak English and it is something that she's so ashamed about. And I was thinking about how, especially as my mom, she was a homemaker. And I often reflect on what that means for an immigrant woman to be between these four walls and that country, this new home, or what's supposed to feel like home will never see her. But what she's made of her life, regardless of whether it's invisible or not, is art of its own. So how dare you mock your mother when she opens her mouth and broken English spills out. Don't be ashamed of the fact that she split through countries to be here so you wouldn't have to cross a shoreline. Her accent is thick like honey. Hold it with your life. It's the only thing she has left of home. Don't you stomp on that richness. Instead, Hang it up on the walls of museums next to Dolly and Van Gogh. Her life is brilliant and tragic. The thread that stays consistent through all of my work is immigrant stories. I think I'm not finished, you know, diving into that. I don't know if I ever will be, you know, and I, I say something during my shows. I say that I could probably spend the rest of my life you know, filling book after book with the struggle and the triumph of my parents and my community, but that still wouldn't even scratch the surface. And so I'm really looking forward to how I continue to explore that in this next decade, but especially how I'm gonna explore that, you know, three or four decades from now. She mentioned how on the bestseller list, even though it's a book of poetry, it's kind of lumped in with all of the fiction books. On stage, she's, she's a poet, but she's a performer. She's somebody who makes jokes and interacts with the audience. She defies any kind of, you know, classical categorization. And uh, she obviously is uh, incredibly successful. It was a real pleasure to talk to her. Uh, here's another Canadian prospering on the world stage. Brooke Henderson is unstoppable at the Tournament of Champions. But first. I no longer need to worry about going back to Russia. 
One man leaves his family behind to find safety in Canada. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has displaced thousands, many fleeing the ruins of war, others refusing to wage it. Tonight, Julia Wong shares the journey of a Russian refugee who now calls Canada home. Trofa Modley is adjusting to a new life as a refugee in Canada. I no longer need to worry about going back to Russia. I, uh, obviously, I felt like fully safe, uh, safe, right? Modley is from Russia. He was visiting his sister in Alberta when the war began. Then his parents received a conscription notice for him. So Modley applied to be a refugee. I don't want to take part in it. I don't want to kill people, uh, innocent people in Ukraine. Over the years, critics have accused Russia of discriminating against LGBT individuals and targeting political dissidents. Refugee claims from people from Russia are climbing back to pre-pandemic levels. One expert is surprised the numbers are not higher. Launching a war of aggression like the Russian state has done against Ukraine, um, I would think that more people would like, would, would have wanted to leave Russia as a sign of protest. Lawyer Simon Yu helped Modley. He says media reports supported the claim. They showed conscripted soldiers were sent to Ukraine, and some who participated in apparent atrocities in Bucha were from his region. It was a relief for, for me and for both of them too, because um, now we know that he does not need to go back and face uh, imminent danger, yeah, whether it's a criminal prosecution by the government or being sent to, to fight in Ukraine. The 19-year-old wants to become a pharmacist, but his sister says a war is not how she hoped her brother could stay in Canada. The price we pay in as a humanity is so much. How many people every day now, you know, losing their lives there? And for Modley, some realities are setting in. Well, of course, like, I, I miss my family, my um, uh, mom and dad who are still there. Now that he's received refugee status, Modley can never go back to Russia, even if there's a regime change. His sister hopes to sponsor their parents to come to Canada so they can all one day be reunited. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Canada's Brooke Henderson won her 13th LPGA title with a commanding win at an event in Orlando, Florida. But another winning result. Brooke Henderson has won for the first time in the state of Florida. After leading all day, Henderson fired a final round 70 to finish 16 under par, four shots ahead of her nearest competitors. The 25-year-old extended her record for the most LPGA victories by a Canadian. Well, it may be the year of the rabbit, but lions are taking the spotlight. When the lion spits it back out, it, like, it's throwing prosperity, luck and money. An ancient tradition to bring health and prosperity to the new year. Next. You're looking at traditional lion dancers. You may have seen some today, especially if you are out at a Lunar New Year celebration. Each dance routine tells a unique story, symbolizing a new year of health, prosperity, and happiness. The tradition has been passed down through the generations, and it's our moment. We just want to uh, show them our culture and have everyone to celebrate with us, and then to keep our tradition as well because the lion cannot talk, so he has to use his expressions to tell the story. Um, it tells the story of a lion jumping across a bridge and it like discovers what's on the other side and then it's curious about the surroundings and nature and then um, we discover like lettuce. And lettuce rhymes with like uh, the cheng, rhymes with like uh, the word money. When the lion spits it back out, it, like, it's throwing prosperity, luck and money, so people uh, would like to catch it and then we make it back to our side of the bridge and just kind of close the performance there. It bridges me with my culture and um, maybe my grandparents or other relatives. Having them be able to see me perform and doing things that relate to them and touches their hearts kind of allows for common ground. 
You know, this morning I, I walked through Chinatown and uh, didn't see any lions, but certainly a lot of excitement. Yes, there was the shadow of what happened in California, and as Susie pointed out in her story, a lot of police were around, but also just a lot of people happy, especially with the pandemic having led to the cancellation of that parade in the past. That is The National for January 22nd. Thank you for being with us. Have a great night.